morning, everyone. How are you? It is Saturday, April 3rd, and this is episode 193, I think, if my memory serves. How are you? I hope that you are doing really well. Um, it is gray and dreary here because that seems to be the spring that we are having. Uh, my name is Rachel and we are coming to you from just outside of Vancouver, British Columbia here in um, southwestern Canada. I can be found pretty much everywhere as well for pearls and uh, I just want to welcome you to this place. If you're a new viewer and you're just checking out the show for the first time, welcome. I hope that you find something here that you enjoy and if you're a returning viewer, thank you so much for continuing on with the show and for watching uh, week after week. If you would take a moment to hit the subscribe button, I would really appreciate that and uh, to patrons of the community, thank you. You guys are the ones that keep the show on the road, on the, on the road, on the air <laughs> week after week. And I really appreciate your time and your enthusiasm and your energy and your kindness in this place. It's just absolutely wonderful. We had a uh, live stream on yesterday morning for the wool circlers. Um, and we talked a lot about some more luxury fibers that we're going to be looking at later in the year. We were spinning um, camel down and uh, we were also looking at some Tussa with Neps in it. That was really fun to spin. I really enjoyed that one actually. And then uh, on Thursday, we had a Maker Morning. And so for those who joined us in the Maker Morning, thank you so much for being there. If you're a patron of the community, there is a Maker Morning playlist and you guys can um, have a look at that, the previous sort of gatherings, if you will. And it's an opportunity for us to sort of get to know each other and to, uh, get to know each other in real time rather than just through live chat or live stream or asynchronous communication on the Slack channel or on Instagram. It's, it's different when you're actually all sitting together, working together or just sitting quietly. Um, Alicia had her, her little one with her and uh, we just share life together, right? So those are twice a month and that's for patrons of the community to sign up ahead of time so that you can be a part of that. And if you are wondering about anything more, you want to ask, you're sort of curious about anything, please just reach out to me, uh, rachel at wellforpearls.com um, if you want to email me. Uh, thank you for the compliment on the shifty. We'll definitely be talking about this today. Um, Martha, thank you so much. That was very kind of you. Good morning, everyone. You guys are chat, chat, chatting away. I'm not, I went back in the chat before I hit um, uh, go live because uh, I just wanted to see <laughs> what you guys were chatting about. Most of you are saying good morning to one another and welcoming each other because um, because we gather every week, uh, you sort of start to get to know one another in, in sort of a funny kind of a way. I sort of feel like if we were all together at like a retreat or a festival or something, we all know each other by our screen names, uh, which is sort of a little bit challenging. However, I kind of have this feeling that we would all just sort of pick up where we left off um, and just chat like old friends, uh, which is really cool. It's neat that you guys are able to kind of jump in and just uh, welcome one another. That is really fun. A lot of people seem to be doing um, food prep this morning. There's quite a few people doing uh, making st things. Um, I think I saw that Jenny was making uh, veggie quiches and Zan's doing some um, uh, food prep it looks like. Um, you guys are talking about mango salsa, my favorite. I'm sorry that you're allergic to mangoes, Dan. That's really too bad. <laughs> I love, I actually had mangoes in my, in my smoothie bowl this morning. I always, on podcast day, I have to make something that's really, really fast that kind of packs everything in and gets it, get, and then I can eat it like quick because 99% uh, of the time we have oats and um, the kids had oats this morning and Mike had oats, but it just, to get it cooked and get it all like on the table and whatnot, it takes a bit too long. So on, on podcast day, it is quick and dirty smoothies for me so that I can just drink it down and, uh, and, and get on with getting ready for the show, but my belly is full and I feel nourished. And, uh, then I have the stamina to keep on going. So, um, and I, I love, uh, mixing it up and making different smoothies. So like this morning it was, um, uh, spinach and cabbage was sort of the base, if you will. And then, um, I put a tablespoon each of hemp hearts, chia seeds, and flaxseed and then uh, half a cup each of blueberries, frozen mangoes, and uh, frozen pineapple. And what else did I put in there? Oh, and then a cup of plant milk. So I, I usually just use almond milk, whatever we have on hand. And then um, 
I top it with a uh, um, diced carrot and a banana. I put a tablespoon of oats on top and a tablespoon of buckwheat groats. Yeah, and it's so good. I just wanna go back and like do it all over again, even though I'm full. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so now that we're all thinking and f talking about food and wanting food, um, <laughs> Jenny says, I'm having smoothies at your house, delicious, yeah. Um, I, I, I really love making smoothie bowls. Um, they're so fast to eat and um, uh, I find them really satisfying because they're so thick. There's not all that fluid in there, so you don't get full on the fluid. Um, because I find with smoothies, like you have to add that little bit more fluid to like you know, water or milk, whatever, um, to, to make it liquid. And I find that uh, for a smoothie bowl, because they're quite a bit thicker, um, they're fast to eat and um, they're, I, I just find you're not getting so full on water. Yeah. All right, so you guys are still talking about food. Oh my gosh, San, you're allergic to bananas. I'm not sure that I could, um, I could, I could, I could do that. <laughs> I love bananas, they're like my favorite. <laughs> Fun fact, my favorite food in the whole wide world, I can eat them like until the cows come home, are raspberries. They are my absolute most favorite food in the whole wide world. And my second favorite is probably a tie between apples and, apples, probably apples, pears, and, apples, pears, and bananas. That's probably a tie, but raspberries are my absolute most favorite food. Um, oh, Doc wants you to go grain free. Oh my goodness, Anne. Yeah, that's that's really hard. Yeah. Um, Kathy loves raspberries too. So, oh my goodness, Anne. They taste moldy to you, really? Oh, you know, actually, I believe you because the kids say that about blackberries. So they'll pick blackberries wild because um, there's blackberry bushes that live, that grow wild all around our house. And they... Um, uh, they they'll eat those and they'll almost like gorge themselves on them but raspberries or but but the blackberries that come like that are in like the frozen mixed berry mixes from the store they say that they are um that they taste moldy to them so it's kind of funny so in today's show because we do actually talk about yarn here and not just food um i've got a couple of finished items one of which i'm wearing which you guys know i haven't actually washed and blocked this yet but we'll talk about that um, I have a big, big, big finished spin here, and I've got another finished item here. So um, we may as well get into the show and um, chat about all those things. And then we've got some beautiful community participation this week that I'm really excited to share with you guys. So I love that you guys are still talking about food. It just warms my heart. Oh, hummus. That's one of my favorite foods too. Hummus should be a food group as far as I'm concerned. Um, if you ever make hummus yourselves, uh, I will post, try to remind me, but I, I've posted it before for you guys, but I'll post it again if you guys want me to. Um, I have a hummus recipe. It's super simple. It's um, basically two cups of chickpeas and um, like four tablespoons of lemon juice and then a teaspoon of cumin and you add sort of water as you need to to um, get to the consistency of the hummus that you want and you pulse that up in your Vitamix or your uh, food processor and um, but the the secret is roast a tablespoon of roasted sesame seeds so you roast those in your toaster beforehand or you can do them really quickly on broil in your oven, but stand there and watch them because they burn like that. Um, so you roast them. So they're fresh, fresh roasted. You can't buy roasted sesame seeds. They're just not the same. You need to fresh roast them. 
and then you uh, grind those up first into a fine powder in your Vitamix or in your blender before you add all the all the ingredients. Best hummus ever. Um, definitely, definitely the the it's my go-to recipe. I've given it to Dorothy too, and she's made it, and she said she said how good it is. So. All right, so let's talk about what's come off of my bobbins this week because I've had a few things come off my bobbins, which has been kind of nice. Um, I haven't had like some, I've had a couple of big spins finish lately, which has been really nice because for a while there, I felt like I wasn't getting anything done. Um, and I was sort of in the midst of these big spins. And I think it was Mars. Um, of Hey Brownberry, who said, you know, it's that slog in the middle of the project that can get really hard to um, sort of continue on with. And so, and she's absolutely right. These two, these, this spin actually went quite quickly. The one that really took its time was the one that we talked about last week that was my Dizdero bat that was my Romney. Um, it's finally dry. The yarn has come out just absolutely beautifully. Later today, I'm hoping this afternoon, I'm going to do some yardage counts and see exactly how much yardage I have and whether or not I have enough to make the Fennel by Orlain Souche because that was what this yarn was for. Um, I'm concerned if I have less than 700 yards of finished yarn, I'm not even going to chance it because I feel like um, the pattern for the size that I want to make the pattern calls for 870 yards so if I'm kind of in the like 800 range like sort of 790 or 820 um, I think I can probably make it work but if I'm below 700 or 750 it's just too too tight um, I'll be stressed the whole time about having enough yardage so um I'll, I'm gonna I'm hoping to do that later today and sort of see because um, I've got these three big skeins of finished Romney um, for that for that spin and then I've got two little sort of partial skeins that are probably about 20 yards um, so that will be something that I'll work on if if I have the yardage that'll be something that I work on for the next little while um, so my other Romney spin is here and this was the um, fiber that came that I was trying to match that my um, um, words, Rachel, the Hello Yarn Kent Romney two ply that I had done on my uh, plyology when I was um, beta testing it for them. So that was this skein here. And I was really hoping to match sort of the grist and the um, uh, quality of yarn with the maize colorway in the Luet um, Romney. Let me just get my, get the skeins laid out here. And then you can really see, cause I've got, uh, <laughs> yeah, you're right, Diane. <laughs> Rachel's not getting anything done is relative. <laughs> oh, you're so funny. Um, so what ended up happening was this um, comb, comb top was really, um, it's quite coarse. The finished yarn is very, it's, it's not like a nice yarn. Um, it's a little bit toothy. It's a little bit, um, it kind of feels a bit like cardboard. Um, I washed it and I, um, you know, really kind of, you know, handled it quite gently after the finishing. It's just got th this kind of not nice feel to it. Um, it'll probably actually wear quite well as a sweater yarn because it's so, like it's not a nice, it's just not a really nice yarn. I don't know how else to describe it. Um, the, the fiber itself, um, it didn't pre-draft particularly well. If I pre-drafted it or pre-attenuated it or anything, um, I think I had talked on the podcast about loading it onto a disc staff and kind of managing it that way. Um, if I handled it too much, it would just kind of fall apart. I think it had either been cut uh, or the original Romney fiber wasn't really very nice or there were breaks in it or it was brittle, or, like something. Um, it certainly wasn't the high quality wool or the high quality fiber that, that, I'm, that I'm used to um, and used to spinning because so often I'm either working from pin drafted roving from mills and, um, you know, um, um, 
preparations where, you know, it's just really, really super high quality. Um, or I'm dealing with sort of stuff like this that's, um, you know, a Kent Romney that's just been beautifully handled in the dyeing process. And, you know, you're, you sort of just get used to this certain quality of fiber. So this was really kind of nice to sort of pause and go back and sort of spin something that was probably what something, something that, that maybe 10 or 15 years ago when I was first learning how to spin, this is what somebody would have given someone to learn to spin on. And this is the reason why new beginning spinners 10 or 15 years ago, we get so frustrated because this wasn't a nice spin, you know, it didn't draft particularly evenly. There was big chunks that would come out. Um, it would sort of, um, you know, just sort of, it was a bit crunchy and just sort of like, it's just not a great prep. <laughs> so the, the long and the short of it is I did my best to match the two um, and to try to spin evenly. But as you can see, uh, or you might not be able to see, the, the maize colorway, the, the yellow, the maize colorway, it, it is thicker. It is spun thicker uh, than the Kent Romney. The Kent Romney spun beautifully and this spun quite a bit heavier. So I think I only have about 500 yards of the maize colorway, which is really too bad because it's not really enough out of eight ounces. That's not really very good yardage for, for me. And it's certainly not what I was hoping for. Um, and it sort of begs the question, um, whether or not I'll have enough to sort of do something substantial with these two. Cause I have quite a lot of yardage of the Kent Romney. Um, but if I hold it up closer to the camera, like you can see, it's just, it, it just kind of has a, like it even looks a bit crunchy. Um, even though it's not over spun, it's not over twisted. It's got a lovely twist angle. Um, there are some inconsistencies in the fiber itself that kind of spun into the yarn. Um, so as I'm knitting, I'll just pull those out. But uh, it's really too bad when you sort of, you know, you spend the time and you spin this stuff and you're really hoping for for sort of certain certain results. And, you you know, you just feel kind of a bit um, disappointed, you know. Um, and it definitely came out a bit thicker than I had hoped. The, this is definitely more of a worsted weight yarn, whereas this is more of a, a DK um, so this is probably going to knit up really beautifully on like four millimeter needles on the Kent Romney and the Romney maze, probably more like five millimeter needles. I would think, um, it's just a little bit thicker cause it's denser too. It's a denser fiber. It feels heavier. Um, so a little bit disappointing, but also, um, you know, not, not the end of the world. I suspect that a little bit of uh, gauge swatching and, and trying these yarns together will probably actually result in, um, finding something that I could use them together in. And if not, um, I, there, <laughs> there is more Romney. I will absolutely be able to find some more Romney. Uh, to spin to to use with this with this uh, skein. I'm just gonna catch up with chat because you guys are going going quickly. Um, I have some brittle tips and lots of VM in some of my fleeces. Yeah. So Dana, you know, I wonder like with your fleeces, what what what's your plan? Like, what are you gonna do with those fleeces? Are you still gonna process them? Are you still gonna try to spin them? What's your um, what's your uh, um, yeah, what's your plan? Um, weave with it. No, it's too thick to weave with. I think, um, especially this stuff, it's, it's just too crunchy. Um, the weaving would make, cause weaving makes like a three dimensional fabric where you've got the over under it would, it would be so thick. Um, good idea, but too thick. Yeah. Um, toothy. It looks toothy. Yeah, exactly. Um, is Romney usually toothy? It doesn't have to be, um, there, this particular Romney, it was the preparation. Like, I don't think that the wool to start with was particularly good quality. And then like, it was probably from a big wool pool or something. 
and then when it was processed into comb top and I'm putting that into brackets because I suspect or into quotes because I suspect that it was bleached I suspect that it was cut um, I suspect that it just wasn't a really nice preparation to begin with and I don't think that carding it or throwing it onto the drum carter would have necessarily um, fixed it um, I think it's just the prep um, but like this is um, a, you know true Kent Romney so this is Romney coming right from Kent where Romneys were originally from um, and the it's just beautiful it's it's soft and it's um, got a really lovely drape it's got an ever so slight sheen just slightly slight sheen not like BFL but a little bit um, and it's it was long stapled it was easy to draft it was really really nice so yeah yeah not a bad idea Lee maybe I should save it for rugs um, I probably don't have enough yardage to do anything substantial with it but um, it's more you know what's sort of frustrating is that um, it's it's the the time that you spend on it it's like ah I could have like gotten something else done <laughs> that's my honest that's my honest opinion um, so that is that I'm going to put that aside for a few minutes and, um, I wanted to talk about my other FO this week. So this is yarn, these really fun little skeins of yarn. This is West coast. Um, oh, and I was going to talk actually before we move on from spinning, um, I was going to talk about my Gotland spin on my Turkish spindle, but honestly, I actually haven't gotten anything done. The crazy thing is that if I spend about 20 minutes or half an hour, um, I will be done because this is all I have left to spin. I've got these three or four or five little nests of fiber to spin. This one still needs to be split down. Um, I have finished my, my uh, 25 grams. This is 25 grams of fiber and I have one more 25 grams to spin. And then I'll be able to ply and I have my other 75 yards here. So I'll have about 150 yards of yarn. And uh, that is for my Aurelius. Is that, is it Aurelius by Jennifer Steinglass? I'm hoping to knit that sweater, um, a fully spindle spun sweater. That's my plan. So this is thread box by Amy King from her spunky eclectic club. Um, I had joined a couple of uh, clubs for during the pandemic to support some of the dyers out there um, at, through sort of that that time when we were all at home so much. Um, and this was uh, one of the months. I think it was November 2020 or December of 2020. It was the last one that I received actually. I think it was December's. So that's thread box. So I haven't worked on that, but I'm so close. I need to, um, it's ridiculous that I haven't finished it yet. To be honest with you, it's kind of a little bit embarrassing because we've been outside and standing outside and visiting and whatnot. But I find, um, I just don't think about it. And it's so ridiculous because I usually take my, um, my spindles outside all the time, but recently I've just kind of been forgetting. So, um, the Aurelia's Aurel, Aure, yeah, Aure, Aure, I'm not even going to try to keep saying it, but basically I'm spinning for this sweater here and I just put it in the chat. Let me catch up with you guys because you are so fast. Um, okay, so Dana says that she will use her, um, she will process and use her fleeces. That's awesome. I'm glad that they don't end up being thrown out just because you've got some problem, like they're, 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 just because there's issues with some of the fleeces that you've, that's really great. Um, let's see. You guys are chatting about fleeces. Um, after I process those fleeces, I will be very familiar with what is spin worthy. Part of the issue is that I am invested in my sheep and feel good using my homestead products. Yeah, I, I would think so. Like you spend all those time, all that time and all that energy um, with your sheep and cultivating those relationships and looking after them and growing their fleeces and stuff. You want, you want to use them and, and learn from them, right? So these little fun little skeins. So that's kind of what's on my bobbins and what's coming off of my bobbins. There's nothing really exciting going on right now with my spinning, to be honest. 
Um, I feel like I'm kind of in between projects right now uh, and uh, it's just because I finished that Romney spin and I finished the other Romney spin, <laughs> all the Romney. So um, it's kind of nice to kind of clear off the bobbins a little bit and kind of get started with some new projects. And uh, I've got one big spin that I'm going to, that I've sort of just started that's going to be going in the background for a while. And then the other big spin that I'm still working on is my CVM spin. So this is on my Kromsky Minstrel. And this fiber is the pin drafted roving that my friend Liz did for me and Greta here up in um, Greta is back to basics. Um, and actually, I think she's here today. I thought I saw her. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, I know she was in the Slack channel earlier. Um, this pin drafted roving is a CV. We did two CVM fleeces and uh, we split them because we knew that neither of us would want like the whole fleece. And this uh, gorgeous uh, sort of tawny, it's actually a little bit more brown than it's uh, registering on the screen. This is uh, bobbin number one. I've already done two three ply skeins that I had done back in Tour de Fleece. I did not get as much spinning done in Tour de Fleece and then spin together. I did, I just did like, didn't, didn't even get close to just spinning the amount in either of those uh, events this past year that I had hoped. So I'm currently halfway through bobbin number two and then I need a third bobbin and I'll ply. Um, and the reason why I'm not doing it all at once and doing one big spin is because the project that I'm working on, which I can't talk about on the podcast just yet, um, is I is sort of big enough that I want I need to make sure I have enough yarn, but I don't want to spin uh, and overshoot and have a whole bunch of yarn left over because I have enough roving here to do a couple of different projects with. So if I could do a couple of different things. Um, I would prefer to do that. So this is, I'm spinning it long draw, um, really super airy and light. Uh, it comes out as a DK, uh, the three ply. So this is kind of ongoing in the background. Um, and I haven't really talked about it very much cause it's just been going on kind of background spinning sort of. So that's the spinning knitting these little skeins of yarn. This one here is West Coast color. I spun this back. I was, I actually had to look it up. I spun this back in November of 2014 and uh, it's just these, these gorgeous reds. There's some sort of earthen tones in there, some yellows, some kind of grellos. Um, there's some areas that have a little bit of orange, pink, it's just a really, really pretty skein. This is all that's left. This was about 50 grams. And then this is all that's left from my 64 grams of Kiviet and Merino blend that I had made that you guys will learn about over the next couple of weeks as the uh, April uh, How I Spin content is being released. So I think the uh, April content... I'm pretty sure that for April, um, no, stuff hasn't been, it, it, it will um, publish over the next week, um, the, uh, the, uh, all the information about this yarn in the How I Spin content. So this is the 50-50 Merino Kiviet that I made. And it's funny, because as I was knitting with it, um, there's still guard hairs in there from the Kiviet. And um, I was pulling all of them out and some of them are just like little teeny, teeny, tiny little guard hairs. And then some of them, I couldn't believe that I had missed them in the spinning process and hadn't pulled them out because they were so long. Um, and I have to say it was quite gratifying as I was knitting to pull these out. <laughs> um, because color work is intense anyway. So as I was doing the color work, because I'll show you those in a second. Um, as I was doing the color work, I was like pausing and pulling, pulling all the guard hairs out. So I was very, um, very cathartic, kind of fun. So these, this is what's left. And this is what I made. So they're all done. I showed them to you last week. They are all done. These are my Hive Mind Mitts um, by Adrian. Um, Basilia. She's Hello Yarn for those who, who know Hello Yarn, but maybe don't know that her name is Adrian. Um, they're a little bit too big for me. I probably would have made them a little bit smaller, but now that I know, um, I can compensate later and it does give me some room to put mini mitts underneath if I need to wear a sort of double layer. 
I'm actually quite shocked at how warm these are. As I was, I haven't washed them yet. They're, they, uh, they haven't been blocked, so the color work doesn't lay totally flat just yet, but it's pretty good considering I haven't washed them. Um, the, uh, as I was working on these, I have to admit, I, cause I put them on a couple of times just to sort of see about the fit. And I was actually quite surprised they are quite warm. Like even just wearing them right now, my hand is warming up. I can feel it warming up. That's how warm these are. So it is true, Kiviet is warm. <laughs> it's this side. Um, I'm quite pleased. I don't do mitts. I think the last pair of mitts I did was, it was years ago. It was the fiddlehead mitts. Do you guys remember those? They had the swirls up the side and you changed color as as they went up. They were, in, it was another Adrian uh, pattern um, and it had the twir the swirls and I did different colors. It's commercial yarn. I still wear those mitts and I've never made another pair because I just wear those. Um, but this really reminded me how much I enjoy doing mittens. And this pattern was the one where you put in the scrap yarn for the thumb and then you pick up your stitches and then take out the scrap yarn and then knit up the thumb. And I found plugging in the color work pattern was actually a little bit challenging. I found it a little bit difficult to kind of figure out, like she gives you the chart for it, but on neither of the mitts did it match up exactly. I had to kind of shift it by one stitch. And um, I did find that a little bit sort of uh, challenging. And look at how beautifully this matched up. So the mitten, look at the how the reds matched up. Isn't that cool? Um, this one was the second one, and I think it actually came out a little bit better. And luckily, unluckily, the color work in this section, the yarn, there was no contrast between the yarns. Um, and so in some ways it kind of hit it a little bit because I think there's a couple of mistakes in there. So I kind of was able to be, I ripped them out twice, and I was like, nope, I'm not ripping anymore. Nobody's going to notice. Um, so they are, they are opposites left and right. And the, you put your scrap yarn in on the side that is that side. So this is the other one modeled for you. Really soft. What I liked about this pattern and part of the reason why I chose this pattern was I wasn't totally sure how far the yarns would go and how much they would actually, you know, um, yeah, how what what how how much I actually needed for them, even though I knew the yardage of both yarns. So I didn't want to do a bunch of braids and, and a bunch of really complicated stuff down here that would possibly have to be ripped out. So that was actually part of the reason why I chose these because they were just a simple rib to start, cast on rib, and then start the pattern. So it's very effective, isn't it? Cute, so pretty. Thank you for the compliments, you guys. Yeah. I think they turned out really beautifully. For those who aren't familiar with this pattern and didn't catch the show last week, these are from Yarnitecture by Jillian Moreno. I often get um, asked by people what I recommend for a intro book on spinning if they're just kind of getting going and haven't done um, and haven't done any reading or don't own any spinning books yet and are looking to kind of buy their first book. I always recommend this one. It is. Um, it really is exactly. Um, it really is sort of the knitter's book of spinning. And the pattern is these. Oh, hang on. This is the pattern. So aren't those pretty? And Adrienne had originally done them for the book um, out of her hand spun. Um, I think it was a Cory Dale that she had used and they were her, it was her own sort of hand painted uh, roving. But the contrast in hers, because the contrast in mine isn't quite as, as notable. Um, for, some people like low contrast color work and some people like high contrast. Um, but uh, for, for, um, for what I was going for, I wanted to showcase the Kiviet. That was the whole point. Um, but I think if I were to make these again, which I'm actually quite tempted to do, I would do something really super high contrast to have more of an effect like this. So these are the Hive Mind by Adrian. Really cool. I think there's another photo in here too of the, them up close. Aren't those pretty? So I think my row gauge was off a little bit. I think I had a slightly different row gauge, which is what made them a bit longer. And to size them, you choose a different size of needles. So I did mine on 3.25 millimeter needles or US size four. Um, and then if you want the next size up, you go up to you. Um, US size 
I wrote in the show notes that I did 3.5s, but I actually did 3.25 millimeter. And then if you want the next size, you go to 3.5. And if you want the next size up, you go to 3.75. I probably actually could have gone down on these to um, three millimeter needles. Um, I think I probably would have, would have actually had a slightly better fix. I don't have very big hands. My fingers are short and stubby, but they're not very big. So yeah, super cool. Does anybody have any questions about those? Thank you so much, you guys. Um, I don't think I would want to put them in the dryer, Eve. Great question. She's asking, could you put them in the dryer to shrink them down a little? I probably could, but then you'd really fuzz up the Kiviet quite a lot. And the Kiviet already obstructs the color work because it's so fuzzy. Um, so I probably would just leave them and enjoy them. I haven't washed and blocked them yet. Um, I think probably when I wash them and when they're wet, I would probably, I, I think I'll just like squoosh them down a little bit. Um, so yeah, they're, they're not, the, the thing is, is because they are a little, little, like a teeny tiny bit too big, like they're kind of like an inch too big on every side. The good thing about that is when it's really quite cool here, I can put a pair of mini mitts underneath and wear them inside of these. So, or I could even pick up stitches here and I could knit a mitten liner and then turn it uh, so that it goes inside. Like I could even do that. Actually, that's not a bad idea. I might think about doing that. Yeah, Leanne says she keeps yarn and texture next to her reading chair. It's there is so much information in there, and I whenever I go through that book, if I'm looking for something, um, usually I'm looking through it because I'm looking for something for our content, either our thoughtful spinner or our spinning pearls or how I spin, where I just want somebody else's opinion. So usually I look through it because I'm looking for like you know, this is how I do things, I wonder how Jillian does it. Or this is how I do things, I wonder if there's a different way. Or I wonder if she does it the same way. Or I wonder, and I often will go to that book first, it, unless it's about sheep specifically. If it's about sheep or breed specific, then I go to my Fleece and Fiber Source book and to Beth Smith's um, book of, uh, Spinner's Book of Fleece. I'll go to those two for that, for those questions. And then anything like spinning and yarn related where I'm just kind of curious to see how other people do things. I go to yarn and texture and I email my friend Kim and um, uh, sometimes I'll email my friend Diana who's in, who's in our chat today. And actually I used to ask my friend Chrissy a lot of like how she did things. Um, but um, she's not spinning as much as she was because she's sort of busy with other things because um, they have three little ones now and they're all like... Uh, her eldest is the same age as my second. So she's a little bit behind me in terms of like the age of her kids. And you guys know when you've got little ones at home and toddlers and stuff, you just don't have the same time that you have um, when they're a little bit older or pre-kids. So um, she, uh, depending on what's going on in your life. So she was saying that she's just not spinning as much as she would like to, but she'll get back to it. Okay, I so if you didn't have any context <laughs> to the question that Dana just asked, oh my goodness, that just cracks me up. It's like this random, <laughs> um, random question. It just made me laugh out loud. It's chat sometimes. Like if you, I don't know if you guys have ever noticed this. I'm sure there are people in our community who are uh, gamers. You know how when you're looking at like I, I'm not a gamer, but my husband. Um, uh, kind of is he likes to he's he's um he's he's in the tech sector he's a director in in technology and he uh he follows a lot of streamers and gamers like he loves sips and there's a couple of other ones that he follows very um and really enjoys them and part of it's because they're dads and they talk about some of that stuff and every so often he'll be watching and he always wears his headphones because it's just blabber right it's what he probably thinks that this is blabber too right because he doesn't know what we're talking about and uh he every so often there like he'll just burst out laughing and he'll be like like that like belly laughing and it's because there's like been this like random comment or this like random co you know thought 
And if you don't have any context, it's just so funny. So the question that um, Dana just asked is kind of one of those moments. Are you a piano player or a gynecologist? If you have no context, it's like, what? <laughs> Anyhow, I love you guys. That's awesome. Uh, Martha's a gamer. I'm sure there are other other gamers. Um, I only want Leanne to be my OB nurse. You guys are so funny. Um, I think it's because Leanne has small fingers. <laughs> oh, you guys are hilarious. Actually, jokes aside, there are a couple of girls that I work with um, that, well, they're women. Um, they have to wear the extra, extra, extra small gloves because their hands are so small. Because if you don't have the right size gloves, um, I'm, for those who don't know, I'm a, I'm a, a critical care nurse. Um, your hands are so small. If your hands are, if, if the gloves don't fit you properly and you're doing something that's like fine motor in the room, um, you like in our patient rooms, the gloves are slipping all over the place and like, you can't, you can't do your job. So we do have a couple of girls who uh, wear, um, extra, extra small women who wear extra, extra small. All right, so let's talk about uh, my shifty. So I have not washed and blocked this yet. Um, I cast it off on, I feel like I finished it on Tuesday night and uh, I didn't actually put it on right away. Um, I was a little bit nervous about putting it on. I was like, okay, it feels like it fits really super well and I feel like it's gonna be okay, but if I put it on and it doesn't, then I'll be crushed. <laughs> So, because my cons my thing with a sweater like this is it's really hard to rip out. Like, the, it would be almost virtually impossible to rip it out. So, the yarns that I ended up using, I put it in the intro credits so that people could reference that if they needed to go back or um, were curious. And I do have... Um, Ravelry project pages, hand spun project pages for all of these yarns. So I'll just go back to product view for just a moment and then we'll talk about this really quickly. I think I actually have some photography of this, these yarns that would actually be easier to show you that I queued up yesterday for you guys. So this is the background color. So this was the, the original swatch and this is the yarn here. Um, this is Polworth in Silk, and I had had this in my stash. Um, it's a West Coast Color colorway. She doesn't really do colorways, but like I've looked on the website, it's still available um, in like a variation sort of idea. Um, Lynn's colors are just, I, she is, her and Kylan of uh, Kinfolk, their colors are totally my colors. Um, she, uh, so, the, so this was the Polworth and Silk, and then the other three yarns, so this was the red one, the ready pink one, and the blue, and this is the roving right now that you're seeing, that's this one. Um, this yarn uh, and this roving that's showing right now, this was actually the background and the yarn that I that I spun and made for my Copenhagen cardigan um, that I held double with some uh, silk mohair. And um, these are all Falkland. So these are like my favorite yarns to spin. I just do them on default. They're super easy. Um, there's no guessing. I know that they're gonna come out as a heavy sport. They puff up in the washing process. Like they're just kind of, they're just kind of like my, when I'm looking for a snack spin, I always go to these fibers. Um, and part of it is because Lynn treats them so beautifully in the dyeing process that like it just, you're kind of, you know, it's just not going to mess up. You know, you know, you're going to end up with okay yarn. And the funny thing is, is that this blue one I did on my Ashford E spinner when I first got it. Um, no, it wasn't the first spin that I put on my Ashford E spinner, but I spun it when we were camping on my E spinner and it spun way too high twist. Um, and it was a little tiny bit crunchy after I finished uh, knitting with it, after I finished spinning it. And most of that twist dissipated in the water and the yarn is still super, super, super soft next to the skin, like no problems, even though it's more firmly spun than the other two. Um, and then the Polworth and Silk, I actually threw back through the wheel um, this one, I actually threw it back through the wheel after I had finished these yarns because um, they I hadn't put enough twist in them. And actually now that I have um, have like finished the sweater, I'm actually really glad that I did that because I can see how the, in the mosaic knitting, 
you have um, basically you have like a double layer right because you're slipping a stitch every time and then in the next row you're knitting that one but you're slipping the other one so you kind of end up with the, this double double layer of fabric um, very similar to what you would have in uh, color work because if you look at the back of color work it's the same idea like you end up with this second layer of yarn across the back right um, and so you end up with sort of like a double layer of fabric. So very, very, very warm. Um, but that also, and so that creates some strength, which is great because you've got sort of that, that lovely thick fabric and it's also very warm. Um, but I was glad to have sort of tightened this up a little bit because um, as I was slipping, there were a few times where I made mistakes where I didn't match up the blips properly and I had to go back and rip out and the yarn just withstood it no problem. Like it just was able to, to handle that. I ripped out a couple of sections on the sleeves a couple of times because I had messed up in a couple of places. So let me stand up and I'll show you the finished sweater. I'll just move my chair out of the way. So this is the finished sweater. Been sitting, so I'll just fix my, fix my shirt. Um, it's... I, I thought about lengthening it a little bit to bring it down to here, but I think it would actually be a bit too long. Um, so it hits, because it hits my, my hip bone here. And then I worked short rows here. So, yeah. So the short rows are across the back here to make the back a little bit longer. Um, yeah. So the blue comes down into the sleeve. I lengthened the sleeve. I added um, some blips here. So I had originally finished the sleeves here and done the ribbing. And then I pulled that out and pulled that all back. And I added an extra two inches in here. And then I worked the sleeves again. Um, it was They were just that little bit too short where they were only coming to here. And I was like, I have tons of yarn. I don't need to, like, I, I don't need to cut it close. I don't need bracelet length. I can go full length sleeves. So I did. <laughs> the other big modification that I did was um, my row gauge. Sorry, yeah, my row gauge was very, very, very different, as was my stitch gauge. No matter what I did, I could not get stitch gauge and I could not get row gauge. So what I did was I cast on at the neck um, the number of stitches for my size. So I followed the pattern for that, I think. I'm pretty sure I did. Um, I didn't work the ribbing first. I, I, I picked that up afterwards. So this is all picked up after. Um, but I cast on, worked the short rows at the back neck. So this is all short rows back here per the pattern. And then I, I just watched as I moved down the yoke and as I did the increases, I just watched the yoke depth. So once I got to the depth that I thought was sort of about correct for me, um, I separated for the sleeves and the yoke and um, kept on going. Now, if I were to do this again, I think that I would actually do one more increase row um, because it, they're a little bit tight right here, just right here. Like it's just that little bit tight um, around the bicep. And um, so when you've got a shirt on underneath like I do today, it's a tiny bit snug. It's not, it's not uncomfortable. I don't feel it. Um, it. It's fine. But just a wee bit more ease would have been nice. Except saying that, if there was more ease, um, it probably wouldn't... It, it, like there's that line between getting too loose and being too tight. So I think I kind of hit a little bit on the tighter side and I could have just added like, you know what, even like half, like a, a dozen stitches would have made a big difference. Like if I had had like, like six extra stitches right in here, just on each side, that would have been perfect. That's all I needed before I separated for the yoke. Um, I used... The needles called for in the pattern which was 3.5 millimeter needles and um, to the US size 4 they're like my favorite needle size they don't hurt my wrist I find them um, they they fit my hands perfectly like 3.5 millimeter needles for me are like uh, you know how there's just those needle sizes that work really well for you like 
five, five and a half, six millimeter needles. Um, I don't know what size that is in US sizing, like, like nines, tens, elevens. They're too big for my hands. So they slow me down. I know that sounds crazy, but like 3.5, 3.25, 3.75, they're like perfect. They're like made for me. It's funny. Um, love the neckline. Thank you, Julie. So the, the neck was different. I cast on, um, I don't know if I have any photos. Let me see if I have any photos and I'll, I'll show you guys what I did. Um, let me see if I can add a photo here for you guys to see. I, I don't know if I have any, but then I'll be able to actually explain what I did. Um, so this is, yeah, I do. Okay, great. Okay. So this is, this is it. I'm going to take these other photos out because you guys have seen them now. So this is what I did. So I cast on um, the sweater um, based on the stitches that I would have had if I had like, you know, um, followed the pattern for the rest of it. So I cast on the stitches for my size and then, um, and I did a long tail cast on, and then I went back and I picked up after the fact, the stitches that I needed for, um, the stitches that I needed for the ribbing. And I probably could have made the ribbing a little bit deeper. Um, I think I did it as just an inch. So this is what it looked like before I picked up the ribbing. And the reason why I went back before I separated for the yoke and I did the ribbing right away was because I was a bit concerned about how flared out it looked. And I knew that the ribbing would like, like pull it in quite nicely and I knew that it would be fine, but I just wanted to make sure and like I said, if I were to do it again, I would add a little bit more to the ribbing because it's about an inch deep. And I think more like an inch and a half would have been um, a little bit better. And I, I could go back and change that. Um, that would be super, super easy to do. So um, I don't know if I have any photos of it up close, um, what the ribbing looked like up close. I might... Uh, nope, that's it when it's still being made. Let's see if I have one where it's up close. Probably this one is the best, and this is actually from yesterday when it was finished. So that's what it looks like up close. Um, and you can see that it lays nicely and it lays flat. And remember, I haven't blocked it yet, um, but it's, it is shallow. It is a little bit shallow. Like that ribbing could have been a little bit longer. You could have done another, another, um, another inch. I'm just gonna catch up with chat really quickly. Looks fabulous, great fit, even though you think the armholes. Thank you, Eve. Um, you guys are reflecting about the uh, different needle sizes for different things. The, I absolutely could not get gauge with this. I don't know uh, what, I think my, my yarns were more like a DK. Um, so even though I was using the same size needles um, that the pattern calls for, I, I never get the same gauge that Andrea gets ever. This is an Andrea Mowry pattern. I should have said that. Um, this is the Shifty by Andrea Mowry. I don't think I actually ever said that. I was just assuming that everybody would know this pattern. So I'm sorry about that because I shouldn't, I shouldn't assume um, I am pretty sure, like, I just, I never get her gauge ever. Um, and I'm not sure if that's just my knitting and the way that I hold my yarns. I'm not sure if it's partially, I actually think this is a big thing. I think it's partly because I am not, um, I, I, I'm working with hand spun. So the gauge is just that little bit different. The density of the yarns is a little bit different. My grist is a bit different. Um, what I like for my, the fabrics is a little bit different. Um, I think it's all of those things. So in the interest of time, um, oh, what are you guys saying about the yoke? Somebody said something. Um, okay. You guys are talking about some of that stuff. Um, I have issues with Andrew's gauge as well. Um, Oh, Jennifer. Yes. That's a great book suggestion. That's okay that it's out of context. The other book that uh, Jennifer's mentioning that she often goes to for, um, spinning advice, if you will, 
is Sarah Anderson's Book of Yarn Designs. Um, if you guys don't own that book, I would highly recommend um, getting your hands on that book. Not necessarily because you're gonna make all of the yarns in it, but because it's just a great reference manual. Um, and if we're talking about stuff um, on the podcast or in the, um, um, you know, in, in the different um, uh, sort of uh, teaching content that we cover, um, you can, it's just a quick reference manual of like, oh yeah, that's how you make cables. Oh, that's some of the variations that you can do. It's just a great, uh, very inspiring uh, book. Let's do community participation. I have a 50 grams of fiber to send to somebody. So the winner of our March giveaway is from random number was Maria in Southern Finland, um, Palmakopu um, on Ravelry. Uh, so Maria, if you could please let me know, she's been, she's uh, uh, one of, she's very active in our Ravelry group and um, she's always sharing beautiful things and the things that she makes. So she, I had asked you guys what spring looks like in your area of the world uh, for March. And so this is what she says about Finland. We have had a very, a lot of snow this winter, still some, but we hope to go skiing today. Usually we have to stop in February. Last year we skied only on our trip to the northern parts of Finland. Uh, the spring is now in the air and the sun is warmer, the days are longer, the birds are singing with new inspiration. Uh, yesterday I saw two white swans on white snow and they looked awesome. So thank you for sharing, Maria. If you could let me know, do you want the uh, Targi, 100% Targi, or do you want the Panda? Um, so this one is Bamboo Merino Nylon. No, yes, Merino Bamboo Nylon. And this one is 100% Targi. So it's not super washed, it's 100% Targi. So if you could let me know which one you want and send me your mailing address. And then for April, I want to know what your favorite mitten pattern is, even if you haven't made it. Um, tell us what your favorite mitten pattern is and you can share in the episode thread on Ravelry. And I know that some will not be using Ravelry this weekend and are, um, because of Ravelry accessibility. So if you are not using Ravelry this weekend, um, and that's been extended, the period of, of not using Ravelry has extended. So in solidarity with uh, Ravelry accessibility. So um, if you uh, are not using, especially if you're not using Ravelry right now, just leave a comment on YouTube, um, not in the live chat, but in the uh, comment section and share your favorite mitten pattern. Um, even if you haven't made it yet, uh, cause actually I enjoyed making these so much that I would like to go through my yarn stash and I'm going to, um, see if I can find some other yarns that I can match up and make a bunch of mittens. Um, uh, my, my, uh, book of yarn designs, it did actually come with the DVD. It was still one of the editions that had the DVD with it. So I was really, um, um, I was definitely, uh, uh, lucky. Um, April 6th. Oh, okay, Eve. I thought I saw April 9th on, on Instagram yesterday. So I, I must be wrong. Um, I thought I saw, um, um, Avita. What's, what's her name? Avita. Um, I thought she had put about, um, that it had been extended to the ninth. So maybe I'm wrong about that. So I don't want to, um, I don't want to say about misinformation. Um, I thought I had said, I thought I had read, I'm going to clarify now actually, because I think that it's important for people to know um, if they want to participate in that, um, in that um, protest. Um, let me just, oh, okay, sorry. Uh, it, for a full week ending uh, April 6th, thank you, Eve. Um, ending April 6th, this will hopefully make a bigger impact. Remember that sharing your experience and interacting with others posts will help others become more aware of what's going on. Thank you to everyone who's participating. So if you are part of that, um, this is the Instagram account so that you can read a little bit more if you are interested. Um, yeah, so let's talk about breeding color study. This is from Jackie. Um, so breeding color study, we're going with our Shetland all the way to the end of June. If you don't know about our breeding color study here in Wool and Spinning, uh, please have a look at previous episodes and at some of the posts on Patreon because all the information is there. Um, Evanita, thank you, Eve. <laughs> I couldn't remember. I knew her Instagram and I was <laughs> drawing a blank. Um, 
the so yeah so that's great um zan's asking what is rav's accessibility thing so you know this is why it's important to be talking about this so that people know because uh if we're not talking about it and just getting the information out there then people uh, won't know so um it, it all has to do with their new design and some health related issues that people with sight related issues are having um and many people are unable to use it because and it's um it's been causing um some it's been causing um health related problems. So definitely um, a conversation that needs to be continued. This is from Jackie. So this is Jackie um, Ravella on uh, Ravelry. Here is my first yarn uh, study, yarn in the study. I started with the white braid and she split the colors to keep them separate to make two ply mini skeins. She knit the lefty shawl using a commercially spun Romney in white to highlight the hand spun leaves. And then she did her second braid, which is this one, um, and she split it in half horizontally and then split it twice lengthwise and uh, knit up a hat to see how the color progressed. And I just love that hat. It is so dark and moody with that black and that uh, navy blue in there. I just think that's fantastic. So thank you, Jackie, for sharing. Um, that's interesting, Dana, that you would say that you notice eye strain and headaches. I haven't had any headaches or anything, but I find the site very bright. Um, I was thinking that when I was using it a couple weeks, um, when it's flipped over on uh, April 1st, um, and the, uh, old RAV was gone. Um, it, my account automatically flipped over cause I had been using the old, um, th uh, the old overlay and, uh, yeah, it, I just find it very bright. <laughs> it's very bright. Uh, Caitlin shares. I love these yarns, Caitlin, just beautiful. This is Maker on a Mission. Um, she shared this on Ravelry. She's finished her second pair of yarns for the study and she's so pumped about how they turned out. She was definitely dubious about the yellow, orange, blue combination on the brighter base and her original samples were uh, especially was especially garish, garish, but she knew she wanted to push herself to make a barber pulled yarn, so she stuck with it. I love this yarn, by the way, you guys. Um, it may not be her favorite yarn on its own, but paired with the rest of the set, it's wonderful. See, sometimes we have to see things in conjunction with other things. I especially love the white skein, which is what I originally envisioned when I set out on this project. It was easier than expected to create the look I wanted, and she will definitely be making these yarns again. And then she goes into how she actually spun all of these yarns. I love that white one. That is just fantastic. Um, I think that's just a wonderful use of color and a wonderful use of playing with color. And then she created it again with the Murit, and you can see those hits in there of the colors. Um, I just think this is really, really well done. Um, Caitlin, really beautiful. Um, Allison shares. I love these yarns. More barber pull. I have noticed, have you guys noticed this? I would love to hear what you think. Um, I've really noticed with this particular study, there's been a lot of playing with barber pole this time around for some reason. Um, I don't know if it's because people have just been drawn to those yarns recently. Um, there's a lot of patterns coming out with those yarns, but I feel like there's been a lot of barber pole play, which is really cool. So Allison wanted to use the different effects of white undyed and Murat, Murat undyed bases with e on each of the colored bases. So the white Murat and oatmeal. Um, she stripped the braids and then she spun um, white on white base to create big color difference in the two ply yarns, create from the, the other two ply yarns, but the difference between the colored Murat base and the white Shetland base and the colored oatmeal base and the white undyed Shetland is much more subtle. Um, she goes on to say uh, how she sort of created these yarns and some of the other information about them. Um, the difference is so subtle to me that I don't know whether to continue to ply the three different bases with the Murat undyed Shetland that I have, or just move on and create other three ply yarns using all three color bases together. I will think on this um, as I plan, and um, she says that she'll she'll kind of keep us posted. She's thinking about making the shift cowl or a shift along hat and mittens to match. These yarns are just beautiful, Allison, really well done. Chat's going, going very quickly. So gorgeous, very clever. 
I'm trying to figure out where I can try that DNA swapping. <laughs> I like that Laura <laughs> DNA swapping. Love the pops of color. I love that white skein. Uh, looks fabulous. Um, how in the world did she make those colors in the white yarn? Um, so the that that was Caitlin's yarn. Uh, she she writes about it in the um, uh, in her project page, so you definitely check that one out. Um, basically, she took some lengths of the fiber. And as she was spinning the white, randomly she would spin in that one length of color. And then when she went to ply it with a fully white, um, with a fully white singles. So the one singles um, had, um, the one singles was fully, was white from end to end. And then the other one she would put in those colors every, every so often. Um, and then when she went to ply it, same with this Moritz skein, um, she got that, that gorgeous hit of like that, that color. I think this yarn here, not, not, not the one that's cycling now, but the previous one, I think if I take out these, I think it will cycle to just those ones that we want to see. So the one, the, the second one down and the last one down, she's used the same, um, um, the same, um, technique. I think that Moritz skein um, with that like random sort of hit of color. So the second one down, the one that's right here underneath my finger, um, that would just be incredible, incredible for a sweater. If the whole sweater was spun that way and then you just knit something that was like a classic raglan top down type sweater. Um, I know Jane Richmond has a pattern that's just like a, a you know, a, a classic, I think she calls it the classic women's raglan. That yarn would be amazing for a natural shades along. That would just be the bee's knees. Well done, Caitlin. This is from Tracy, hand spun sweater. Sweaters, she shared this on Ravelry as well. She decided to use up some of her quote, precious hand spun. You know those skeins that just look too pretty and need, need just the quote, right project. Uh, for just the right recipient. Of course, I had to hold a strand of mohair with the hand spun, hashtag team mohair. <laughs> well, the time came, my grandson, another on the way, and my friend's child, worthy recipients and mothers. The patterns are flax for the brown and green sweaters and then making tracks for the yellow one. Well done, um, Tracy, just beautiful. And perfect sweater patterns because um, they, you know, the yarns go really super quickly. Um, you can use up the whole skein in the one project. And of course you showcase your beautiful hand spun. Really nicely done, Tracy. I love this green one. This is my favorite one. I think it's just gorgeous. Next is from Claudia. She's also been making hand spun sweaters. Uh, Claudia is from the uh, Montreal area. She joined us on Thursday for the Maker Morning. It was so good to see her again. You all make me want to spin enough for a sweater. This is my first sweater using some hand spun only for the contrast color. You got to start somewhere, Claudia. Um, I'm not at the stage where I feel like I can spin for a full one yet, but you will. I'll get there. You absolutely will. And this turned out beautifully, Claudia. Really, really nicely done. I'm cognizant of time because we've got queries and explorations coming up next. Uh, so I, I want to be aware of the time for, for that group. But if you guys are okay to hang on for a couple more minutes, we've got a, a little bit more sharing to do. This is from Sarah. This is for her uh, natural shades along. And I wanted to share this because this bobbin just makes me smile. I've been prepping and spinning a Shetland and Finn fleece. So Sarah, you could use this for your breed and color study if you wanted to as well. Um, I'm planning a three ply for a sweater, spun long draw on her Canadian production wheel. Beautiful, really gorgeous. Next one is from Mars. This made me laugh. This is her Manx Loten. So this is um, Natural Shades Along. Uh, her playtime with her Manx Loten, it really took a good turn last night. She sat down to read the new ply magazine, which is Double Coated Fleeces. In the full, in the first full article I read, there was a little, there was a line that completely changed my whole path for prepping this bundle of locks. It suggested for the locks to, that include wool and hair that it may help to roll the fiber off of hand carters perpendicularly. So the short end of the carter. So rolling this way instead of rolling parallel. I tried it and it made for a much smoother drafting experience on the spindle. I've been playing with this fleece a bunch the last few days and things are starting to click a bit. Beautiful, 
uh, Mars. And actually her photos of her spindles are just, it's just gorgeous. Zan loves Manx. We had this whole conversation about Manx in one of the first Maker Mornings. So if you guys haven't seen that and caught up with that, if you're a patron of the community, definitely have a, have a watch through that because we had um, some real, we really got the giggles about Manx lochen. It was so funny. I know Kelly's not here today, but it's one of her favorites as well. I actually have some in my stash that I'm really excited to spin. So um, it's part of my Natural Shades Along sweater and I just haven't started it yet. And I was thinking in, in solidarity with Mars and Kelly that I would maybe pull mine out. Oh, Mars, you're so funny. I heard my name and squealed just now. <laughs> That's wonderful. I'm here to please. Uh, this is from Barbel. She, I just love this. This is just so wonderful. This is part of our natural, this is part of our luxury fibers along, which is going on through our, throughout the whole year here at Wool and Spinning. Barbel, um, she actually, she already finished spinning and swatching for her cashmere. So we did cashmere in March and some people are keeping up with the monthly studies and some people are kind of going at their own pace and some people are watching from the sidelines, whatever works for you. Um, she purchased fibers from Martina's Love for Wools in Germany. Um, and she spun long draw from the cloud to create a two ply. So this is hundred percent cashmere. These fibers were very fine, about 14 microns. She usually prefers durable yarns, but she really liked the softness and delicacy of the cashmere. Um, she wanted to knit something usable. So she combined it with her sample of sari silk and knit a little brio shawl. Um, although the silk is half as thick as the cashmere, she feels that both yarns came out beautifully in the shawl. Researching on the internet about cashmere fiber, she learned that there are different qualities depending on where the fibers come from. The main producers of cashmere fibers are China and Mongolia. Chinese fibers are softer, but they are shorter than Mongolian. And as cashmere goats can cause environmental damage, there are governmental projects in Mongolia to prevent that and produce organic certified fibers. So one of the things about, um, we included this in our March content in the Thoughtful Spinner. I think it was the thoughtful spinner that I wrote about this. Um, they really um, uh, leave the land where they're farmed. Um, they really uh, degrade the land and leave it quite barren because they eat everything. Um, and there's uh, a lot of, there's a push sort of to revitalize that industry, the cashmere industry, but then there's the environmental concerns. So um, yeah, I wrote about that in, in the uh, thought, I think it was in the thoughtful spinner, but it might've been in, in how I spin. I actually, I can't remember. I'm pretty sure it was thoughtful spinner for the um, April, uh, for the March content. This is from Laura. Um, I included this here because April, we are going into our Kiviet and I wanted to include her Kiviet uh, um, study. She shared this in the Slack channel. Since luxury study is moving into Kiviet, I'm going to share my Kiviet story so you can laugh at me. My husband, while born in Wisconsin, go Packers, uh, moved to Alaska when he was three and he grew up there. My mother-in-law dabbles in crafting. My knit and crocheting led her to pick up hers again. I got my wheel for Christmas in 2006 and she found out about my spinning and mentioned Kiviet. I had no idea what it was, but she said, direct quote, I'll, I've always wanted to knit some Kiviet before I die. <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but when your future mother-in-law says something like this and Kiviet yarn isn't really a readily available thing anywhere at the time, but if you call around, you can maybe get some fiber. You're going to try to make that happen. <laughs> So on my husband's recommendation, I called the University of Alaska Fairbanks Large Animal Research Station because the Umingmak site doesn't have anything available. So Umingmak is the Inuktitut word for uh, muskox. Um, and Lars has them give them a call because they were the only other source you can buy from at that time. So Lars is the large animal rescue station. I ordered two ounces of clean fiber and I think it cost around $80 or so. Needless to say, I was not ready for this spin. It was very much beyond my skill level and, my, and, it, and the expense of the fiber scared me. I just knew I was going to ruin it, so I didn't spin it up until October of 2014. I didn't enjoy this spin because I hate short forward and I chain plied it because it was so very thin and I wanted my mother-in-law to be able to knit with it comfortably. I give you two ounces, 175 yards of heavy lace light fingering Kiviet. I hated it so much <laughs> that this is the only photo I took of it. 
<laughs> my mother-in-law said she made an infinity scarf out of it that she wears around the campfire at night, uh, full-time RV lifestyle retirement. Uh, Laura, I just laughed so much when I read your story. And um, thank you for sharing because I have to say your yarn is beautiful. <laughs> So as much as it was such a challenging spin, um, your yarn turned out really, really nicely. This is from Elizabeth. Love this. These, this photo just makes my heart sing. Finished the sampler box. So this was the spin box from San Joe Silk that they made for us for wool and spinning for the community. Um, they're actually still available on the website. So if you want to jump in and, and participate, um, just look for the wool and spinning spin box on the San Joe website. Um, it's still there. Uh, and there is a discount code in the Patreon stuff um, that you can access. Um, it's, um, uh, and, and I think, I think Diana's going to leave it up like indefinitely. So if you guys are still participate, want to participate, like please hop on in. Um, so Elizabeth finished her spin box. She spun the silks short backward draw and the cashmere silk from the fold. She's really happy with these. She learned a lot. The difference in each of the silks is so interesting and both in the spinning process and in the feel of the finished yarn. She spun the Bombex first and found it really challenging, but she wonders if she were to spin it now after spinning the other silks, if she would find it easier. The Erie is her most favorite, which is the one that's on the very far side. It's like way, way, way over there. That really, really super white one. Um, and it really inspired her to branch out. Her local yarn store has some silk and silk blends and she's picked up a cotton silk blend and some silk hankies to try out. That's wonderful, Elizabeth. Um, the wool, wool and spinning community is, we're gonna do a sort of a year end luxury sort of webinar together. Um, we'll do it sometime in December to kind of round out and finish our um, luxury fibers um, sort of year, if you will. Um, and we're gonna be doing um, silk hankies or mawatas um we're going to do them together so uh definitely we'll spend an hour together on zoom everybody will be invited we'll do it as like a webinar um and we'll open it up afterwards and we'll we'll work through spinning spinning our silk hankies and our mawatas together and that's going to be in our next uh spin box so diana is going to make a spin box for us that will be released um, in the summer, late summer sometime, and silk hankies will be in that box. So then you just put them aside and we'll spin them together in December as kind of like a year end celebration party kind of thing. This is from Sarah. This is hand spun knitting. Uh, she had some bulky weight silk down in her stash that she dyed, spun, and chain plied sometime last year. She fancied a quick project, so she improvised these rather than, uh, and these rather mismatched mitts. I think it's beautiful. Well done, Sarah. Gorgeous. Nice way to finish the show. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. I know chat's been um, chatting um, while we've been, um, uh, while I've been reading the community participation. Thank you so much for your, um, for your thoughts and for, for participating today. Uh, Deborah says you guys rock so much inspiration. Diane, Diane says I'm suffering from inspiration overload over here. <laughs> Um, these community shares are making me drool. Everything is so unique and so beautiful. You are the most inspiring bunch, says Jose. Thank you for, for saying that. Um, Leanne says, it's so inspiring to see everyone's work. I need to set some time aside each day to spin. You know, it's, I, it's funny that you would say that Leanne, cause I find like there's days that go by where I don't get onto my wheel either. And I really miss that time. And, um, you know, even if it's just five, 10 minutes, it's like stretching, right? Um, you know, we miss it when we don't do it. And of course, so often we don't do it and then we do it and we're like, why am I not doing this every day? So um, I really like some of those um, uh, think those sort of alongs on Instagram, you know, the hashtag spin 15 a day, some of that stuff. I think it really helps just get you on your wheel. Like you can do a lot in 10 or 15 minutes. So we've got queries and explorations starting at 10 o'clock. So in about 10 minutes. So I am going to say goodbye as much as I don't want to. We've had a very long show today. So thank you for um, being here. That is so cool, Julie. My goddaughter used to raise those muskox at the University of Alaska. That is so cool. Um, and Jackie says, I regret not buying some kiviet when we lived in Anchorage. There are people in this community that actually can probably hook you up with some kiviet. So um, if anybody in the Slack community um, wants to sort of let people know um, if they have any that they could um, do an exchange. 
Uh, I know there are people in our community that, ha that have access to it. So you guys can probably figure something out. The other thing um, that I was going to mention really quickly, I think it's gone. I think it like came into my brain and now it's gone. It was something, oh, um, when we went up to Whitehorse the year that we did our Yukon trip, um, it was really interesting. It was 2019 because as we were driving up, of course, you, you run into a lot of people that are doing the pilgrimage, if you will, from various parts of the States up to Alaska. And, um, there were, there, that, that particular year, there was like a, a huge, it, it was a big, big, big year, which is kind of lucky because then 2020 happened. Um, but there was a 50 year, um, reunion for the University of Alaska for that year. Um, and so there was this huge group that was going up for the 50 year reunion that were graduates of the University of Alaska. And it was so neat talking to some of them because some of them were from Alaska and had grown up there and then left after university. Some, um, uh, had gone to the University of Alaska for school and then had gone back to wherever they came from or jobs or whatever. It was really cool. Um, yeah. So I hope you guys have a wonderful week. I will see you next week, same time, same place. And until next time, happy spinning, happy knitting, happy weaving, happy dreaming. And I hope that you are staying safe wherever you are and um, maybe getting out a little bit um, as things sort of lock down in some places and open up in others. So uh, Stay sane and I will see you guys next week. Bye.